Can I ask a question? I'm yes. recording the session, Varya. Okay, thank You're you. You're being recorded. Thank you. We can start. Wait, someone had a question first, though. Yeah, I, I had from the from last uh, last week. Yeah. Hey, if uh, someone uh, uh, someone speaks and they think that he's saying uh, he's saying complete bullshit, okay? That, 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 I swear for the world, but uh, that's what I think. But is it worth it for me to to say it in the POI or? Because if I say it, then he might have a chance to correct himself and make yeah. the argument. Uh, okay, so so there's there's so there's a number of answers to this. The first one is, um, do you think the judge knows that they're saying bullshit? Is the biggest question. If you think that the judge knows that they're saying bullshit, you're safe, right? The judge won't credit them with anything if you have a clever judge. Um, if they're saying the earth is flat, they're probably not going to win this argument. Um, then you can always point out with the short POI that points out why they're wrong. I know that, that like you said, that you, this might give them an opportunity to correct their case, but you would want them to be able to correct their case for two reasons. First of all, this is a gentleman's game and you'd like everyone to be at their best behave, like at their best performance and still win them. And the other reason is that in most cases, people won't be able to answer your POI in a decent and clever way, giving you more points. So that's the second reason. I will tell a very short story about stupid cases, and then hopefully you guys will learn to like to to point out stupid cases. It was in 2016. It was European Debating Championship. I was debating with a friend whose name is Daniel, and we came into a room, and the debate topic was whether the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra should play Wagner. If you don't know who Wagner is, he's a, he's a anti-Semite who made pretty good music, uh, but also was championed later on by Nazis. So he wasn't necessarily a Nazi, but he's a pretty bad dude. And while you are allowed to play it in Israel, the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra usually doesn't play him. Um, and there's this whole discussion. And it's, in my opinion, it's kind of silly. I'm a classical musician. I play the flute. I listen to Wagner. His music isn't anti-Semitic, but also isn't that amazing to go against all, you know, laws and senses and say, we have to play this because the integrity of culture, because I don't think such a thing exists. Anyway, so Daniel and I walk into this room and we had a judge who was not European. He was south from somewhere in Asia. So the Holocaust discourse is obviously a little more foreign to him than what we have in Israel and to what we have in Europe. And this really nice uh, team from Finland ran an amazing case that basically said, if you play Wagner in Israel by the Philharmonic Orchestra, it's going to be um, broadcast by the radio. And that is going to fuel the Israeli art right who are anti-Semitic because they will feel like they're being backed by the Israeli establishment. So many wrong things, right? First of all, the Israeli alt right usually doesn't listen to classical music, specifically not to Wagner, right? This is not the type of people that you would assume listen to Wagner. Second of all, the Israeli art, right, might be anti-Semitic, but probably not against Jews, right? They will be anti-Semitic against probably other minorities in Israel, specifically probably Arabs and Christians, right? So many wrong things. So Daniel and I thought that this was such a silly case that no one would credit them. These guys got the first in that round. So I will forever remember walking out of that round, having no idea about what happened. So it's best if you point out uh, silly arguments. Okay, hopefully that answers your question only. All right, let's uh, jump into uh, Prime Minister. And did you miss, did you miss my uh, pink, my pink, um, um, Aesthetic? Yes? No? Listen, these are the colors they have, and I'm pretty happy with them, so they're staying. Um, I'm very happy with them, so, uh, and that's it. So this is what you're going to have, whether you like it or not. It's a dictatorship. Cool. So right before we start off with Prime Minister, we all know that Prime Minister is the first speaker, right? We all know they speak for seven minutes, they don't have a rebuttal, they get to do things, but what do they actually do? 
So before you start being a prime minister, you're probably, you probably have to think about how to think about emotion. And we're going to have a short introduction about the types of emotions we have in debate, and then we'll go into what a prime minister actually does. So first of all, there's three types of emotions in the debate world. And this has to do mostly with, uh, with the game itself that we're playing, but this also has to do with just conversation that we have and understanding where, where are the borders and what are we talking about. So first of all, there are open motions. This means that there is a lot of things that prime minister and opening government can do as a team, right? So for example, we have a motion, this house believes that apples are better than bananas, right? What does it mean to have better? What are the reasons? This is a motion where you can talk about what do you talk about when you talk about apples? What do you mean when you say bananas? Do you only talk about the regular bananas that we have in the West? Do we also talk about mainland African bananas that are not sweet and they are actually being cooked with meat? Um, what is better? What is the criterion for things that are better? Right? So the motion is really, really wide. So the first step of motion is when you look at a motion as prime minister, just look at it and try to understand how much freedom do you have as prime minister to find the borders of this debate, right? For example, this house would press the nuclear button. Well, there is a nuclear button somewhere, presumably, um, and Trump had uh, access to it for four years and still has. And the question is, why should a button be pressed? What does this button activate? Like, these are actual emotions that we can run. And the debate really changes based on what go, uh, like the prime minister might say. The second type of motion is half open motions. This means that you have some definition, some things that are said in debate, but quite a lot of things aren't said, right? So for example, this house would change the taxation system uh, from flat tax to a progressive tax. Is a, it's a half open motion because you do know that you have to defend progressive tax system. I'm assuming all of you know what a progressive tax system is. Everyone knows progressive tax systems? Yes, no? Quickly, progressive tax progressive taxations mean progressive taxation means that different people of different incomes get different taxes right so if i get 4000 shekels a month i don't get taxed if i get 8000 shekels a month i get taxed for example 10% if i get 50000 shekels tax a month i get taxed 50% of my income right so progressive tax uh, tax means that the taxes reflect or the the percentage of the tax tax reflects how high your income is. And in this motion, this house would change the taxation system from a flat tax, everyone gets the same tax, to a progressive tax, basically means that the opening government has to defend a progressive taxation system, but may decide what type of progressive taxation it may have, whether people who get 50,000 shekels will get taxed, for example, 50% of their income, 40 or 70. And all of this, these different changes affect the type of discussion that is going to be held later on. So this is half open motion, where there's a very clear thing that you have to defend, but there is some leeway in defending the motion and changing a little bit the mechanism. And the third type of motion is a closed motion, where you really can't have a, like any changes in the motion. So for example, this house would abolish income tax basically means that you're not going to have any income tax whatsoever. And that means that there's very little leeway for opening government to change anything. And the comparative in this debate is really clearly set. Okay, so there's just three different types of motions. Up until this moment, we mostly had open, uh, half open or closed motions because they're easier to access because the comparative is very clear. From now on, we're going to start having a little bit more fun. Cool, questions about the types of motions that exist in debate, also in conversations, right? Uh, yes, about the closed motions, specifically yes. this uh, example. Yeah. Uh, but the prime minister could say that we, we will abolish income tax, but we will hire the rest of the taxes. So there is like a little freedom. No, I, I missed that. So we will abo abolish the income tax. Income tax, but the rest of the taxes are going to be higher, for example. Yes, of course. Yeah. So yes. that's that. I, but 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 you have to but you really and I think that's pretty obvious from the motion like that's very much to be expected, um, and it's and the comparative is mostly pretty similar, right? Okay. And really change the conversation. Whereas when you compare it to this house believes that apples are better than bananas, 
it's a little harder to predict the type of arguments that are going to come out of this debate. Cool? All right. Yeah. Other questions? Cool, let's go. So when we talk about debate specifically, we talk about three types of debate. We talk about policy, analysis, and perspective. Up until now, you've had mostly debates that are policy. Uh, that really say there is a proposition and we're changing the world to a, specific, to a different type of world through a policy change. But there are two other types of debates. The second one is an analysis motion and the third one is a perspective. So the policy basically says this house would. For example, we said this house would, we gave the, this house would ban alcohol, right? There is a legislation, there is a policy to be made, there is a law to be proposed or to be passed and this is what this debate is about, right? There's a policy that you're trying to convey and to persuade the voters to vote for you. But debate or any type of conversation really isn't just about lawmaking, right? I think most of you will agree with me. And this is why we have analysis motions. And this means that the motion is typically phrased, this house believes that. So for example, we can have the motion, this house believes the dog is man's best friend, right? So there's no policy proposed, but there is a conversation to be had about this idea. So quite a popular uh, motion or a, an easy way to explain this is the motion of this house believes that communism is preferable to capitalism, for example. Um, I'm neither, but it is a motion that compares two ideas and says, we have two types of, oh, we'll talk about this very soon, but beliefs motion basically says there's two worlds. There is no change, right? There's no policy. There's no law that is being passed. Just two worlds that we're trying to compare. And this is an excellent form to either compare ideas, so communism versus capitalism, or just to have a conversation about a different type of world that is not likely to exist, but would still like to talk about. So for example, this house believes, or, um, uh, or this house prefers, that might also be a phrasing, this house prefers a world with only one religion. So it's a motion that I personally really like because I think it's quite interesting. And this is a mo debate that you don't talk about policy, but you compare a world with multiple religions to a world with only one religion. And there is a question of how that world would actually look like. And I think that's quite an interesting conversation to have. Or this house believes that, that the world, that, that, that this house prefers a world where people don't believe in a concept of an afterlife. Like that's also an interesting conversation to have in a debate and you get some of the most interesting arguments. Just for an example, usually um, Bison people tend to like these types of motions less, but I think they're really great. So if we go back to the motion about this world prefers, this house prefers a world with only uh, one religion, I heard one of the most interesting arguments in my life, which says, truth is out there. If you have only one religion and that religion is wrong, then you're condemning the entirety of humanity to hell. But if you have multiple religions over time, chances are that you might get at least some people a chance to be saved from eternal hell if it exists. And... In that world, it also means that over time, the ideas might, the best idea might survive better and more people will believe in the right faith. Again, it's an argument. You can rebut me in your heads. I just think it's a very good challenge to our mindsets that don't just uh, compare, you know, um, how the world necessarily works at this moment or affects an immediate results of a policy, but really try to use our brains to compare even abstract ideas. Again, things I enjoy, you might disagree with me and be wrong, but it's your prerogative. So the yeah. final type of motion is a perspective motion. Oh yeah? So, yes. Can I ask a question? Um, at the end of the slide, cool. So a perspective motion basically means this house as. So it's a motion that says, we're going to pretend that we are a specific actor in the debate, and we're going to debate the whole debate from their perspective. So for example, this house as Putin would not annex Crimea. Do you remember 2014, Putin annexed Crimea, a bunch of people died. 
So I think that's a that's a motion that doesn't ask whether the annexation of Crimea is necessarily a good thing, but asks whether it is in the interests of Putin. And that requires us to talk about Putin as an actor and talk about specific interests. So for example, if you follow any world news, this house as Harry wouldn't leave the royal family. And I think that's 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 a motion that requires us to ask. Okay, so what are the interests of Harry? What does he want to achieve? And whether he achieves this through this type of motion, right? So are his best interests kept when he's part of the royal family and taking part in his royal duties or whether he's much happier doing his own thing in Canada with uh, Meghan? We don't know, it's a debate and it's a fun debate to have. So questions, yes, Laurent. Um when being the opposition for the analysis uh, type of debate um is it valid to like is it interesting uh, to talk about uh, what it will cost to make this thing a possibility so what it will cost to make the entire world one religion or it's it's irrelevant that's a really good question no it, it really isn't um usually these this type of phrasing is used for a uh, for a comparative that can't happen in real life, but they would still like to debate it. Um, you can't talk about the transition in policy because it's part of the policy making. But the capitalism versus communism, it doesn't exist, right? You can't make the world communist. You can't make the world capitalist. We're all somewhere in between. And some would argue that real capitalism or real communism never even existed. I mean, but it's an argument that, that that's being made. So you just compare, uh, these ideas. Cool. Okay. Other questions? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I go one? Um, whose interests are we representing in the analysis one? Like in the policy one, we represent like a government, right? Representing the people and in the perspective, obviously, we represent, say, Prince Harry's interests. Analysis? So the same interests that are represented by policy, because in policy, we don't really represent the interests of a specific country represent a general Western liberal democracy interest, which is basically us. So in analysis, you try to find an objective or a metric. We'll talk about this very soon in the next slide. But you try to find what is the most important thing in this debate and then try to achieve that. So for example, the communism versus capitalism, you might say the most important thing in this debate is wealth. Or you can say the most important thing in this debate is happiness or the most, this, or, you know, Whatever. So I think a good a good example for this would be um, uh, this house would join the Twenty Seven Club. Are you familiar with the Twenty Seven Club the idea? So a bunch of famous people died before they were twenty seven, right? Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse. Jimi was... Hendrix. Yes, Jimi Hendrix. Yes, I'm so sorry. I'm embarrassed for my terrible pop culture knowledge. Right. So this house would join the Twenty Seven Club. So it's not necessarily an analysis motion right because it doesn't say it believes but there is no policy to be to be had right there's no law that you're passing but there's a question is what would you rather have would you rather have like a very crazy fun life and then die from an overdose oh there was a, that, that the dj that also died a couple years ago never mind it's just other famous people um or would you rather have like a normal life and you know sometimes the debates in the evening and probably have a family and die when you're 80 but and not have like the crazy happy peaks of the 27 club right and then what you have to establish in this debate is what is important right you decide what is the priority of an average person is your priority to experience the most amount of happiness in the shortest amount of time or whether you just like to have a linear amount of like a slightly upwards uh, happiness diagonal uh, over many years. I don't know, like that. that's the conversation that you have. And you really have to decide what's important because you might say happiness is important, but you might still say self-actualization is important or, or friendship is important or family is important or contribution or living a mark in this world. Like all of these are different uh, purposes that think or purposes of life, right? Things that give us purpose and you get to, to decide which one is more important. So in this, this case, we're not represent, we're not considering the concept nationwide, right? We're not saying no. we, we would like everyone to die at 27 because that's obviously terrible. Well, in that, in that motion, no. In that motion, no. But in the communism versus capitalism, you do. 
So it's kind of finicky, like what mindset you get, like what perspective you're taking, right? Yeah. In the situation. Yeah. Other questions? Because I want to dive in into prime minister's speeches. Cool. Let's go. So we're going to talk about about on about uh, talk about the how you would like to formulate um, a prime minister speech for each of these debates. So the first debate is a policy debate, and every policy debate always always has a ha, should should have a problem, right? Otherwise, you would not propose a change in the status quo. So every debate should really, really have a problem that you're trying to define. I think we talked about it last week when we talked about rebuttals, right? So for example, um, this house would ban alcohol. What is our problem? With the alcohol? Alcoholic people? Yeah, alcoholic seems to be a decent problem. This house would, um, what did we do? Um, this house would require to open Zoom cameras. What was the problem? Teachers having a hard time lecturing. For example, teachers having a hard time lecturing or students not listening and participating in class, it might also be a possibility, right? So every debate that has a policy in front of it usually means that there is a problem that we're trying to solve. So you'd always have a problem. And I'd say that you need to have two criteria uh, for, the, for, for, for the problem. It has to be immediate, like you have to solve this now, and it has to be huge, like a, like a magnified problem that really needs to be solved. So for example, this house would legalize prostitution. What is the problem? Worker rights of prostitutes being... That's a good answer. No, please no one say um, women who don't work because that's not a problem that we solve with prostitution. So other problems that you can solve uh, by, uh, by having uh, legalization of prostitution other than worker rights? Criminal activity. Criminal activity, I think that's also. Right? So different debates, a, a debate may have more, more than one problem, and you really have to decide what type of problem they want to present the centerpiece of this debate and then have that. Okay. And then the spot, second part of your debate, which we're going to go into deeper very soon, is the mechanism. Because really, I think you've encountered this, but every debate with a policy really can change. Like we talked about an open and half open and closed motion, really talks about the idea that prime minister has a chance to define how this debate is going to work. And we're gonna talk about this in a second, but a mechanism really sets the mechanism of this debate, what this debate really, what the debate really is about. And it's really important to make sure that when you set a mechanism, well, we'll talk about it in, in the next slide, but the mechanism is very, very clear and it sets the borders of what this debate is about. The third point is education. Like many arguments, many debates, there is a principal case to be held, right? Do you remember the example about the motorcycle? This how it would legal would ban motorcycles? Do you have, guys have a recollection of that, right? Do you remember there's a whole question of whether the government has a right to ban this thing, whether this is something that's allowed to be banned at all, right? Or for example, um, do you guys remember the NGO uh, motion about whether uh, we should um, depend uh, aid to third world countries uh, based on their uh, ecological uh, work being done. Do you guys remember this one? There's, there, there's a question of whether we're allowed to, you know, to make aid dependent on anything, whether aid is not something that we owe to these countries as opposed to making it dependent on how they act on the ecological arena, right? There's a whole conversation to be had about that. The fourth point is I like to call them utilitarian outcomes. Basically, there's a lot of benefits to be held from different policy suggestions. And it's really important to understand why this is going to work, right? Why this mechanism solves this problem, how it's being solved. And then lastly, why worth everything else? Because and this is my last point. I think I talked about in the previous meetings, every debate always 
has something that you're going to lose. There's no case that is, you know, iron made and can't be rebutted. Every case can be rebutted. And that is where we introduce the very Jewish idea of a sacrificial lamb. I'm going to very quickly explain why a what a sacrificial lamb is. Basically, this is, I just, my trainer taught this to me. I really like the idea. So now you're going to use this as well. In Hebrew, we call it selola. Basically, the idea in Judaism in ancient times was that you may go home and you may sin. So what you do, instead of being punished by God, you take a little goat or a sheep and you bring it to the temple and you kill the sheep or the goat and then they're killed instead of you. That means that there's an idea that you sacrifice something small so something big can stay alive, mainly your life. In debate, we have the same idea. What we like to do is we like to make sure that we sacrifice something in a debate. Opposition is going to win based on something or have the chance of winning based on something. What you want to do as prime minister is identify that thing and then try to sacrifice and say why it's not important. So for example, if we go back to uh, uh, um, the example of motorcycles, we save a lot of lives, but we sacrifice something. We sacrifice uh, freedom of movement, for example. And what you really have to do is to explain why this freedom of movement is worthy of sacrifice. With the aid motion, you really want to make sure that the aid that is sacrificed to this country is worthy or worth it compared to the benefits that you have. But you really have to acknowledge the biggest and the strongest arguments of opposition and try to rebut it ahead of time, preemptively answer their case. And that makes you really, really well and strongly put in the debate. So these are the five stages of the policy debate prime minister's speech. Questions on that? Yeah, uh, two questions. First, yeah. um, uh, the sacrificial uh, lamb, um, you, 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 like you said, it, we should rebuttal that before. Yeah. Is this, can this be one of the main argument, main of, one of the two argument, or should it be like a show this? It really depends um, on the sacrificial lamb um, and how big and strong it is, right? In some cases, you might want to go as far as spend a whole whole two minutes and make a point separate and not within of itself. Or in some cases, you just want to make it very small. Sometimes it's difficult to foresee what opposition is going to say. So you might just say, have something very, very short and then see what they're try going to try and, and respond with. Really, really depends on the motion. So I think with the, um, with the motorcycle is very easily um, uh, foreseen. Uh, with banning prostitution, opposition and riot may, may run two cases from opposite directions, right? One side of the, op one opposition may say, listen, we're libertarians. We think that government has no right of intervening in any shape, way, shape or form. Just leave pro like women and their workers rights alone. Or they can go and say, no, this isn't enough. The government should just ban it all together and not have any laws about, you know, nothing should be tolerated. The only way to ensure workers' rights is to eliminate them, for example, right? To try to, and these two cases are mutually exclusive. They can't coexist. Like it's either or, you can't have them both. Um, so, it's, so, so it's really important to try and um, manage your sacrificial lamb accordingly. I, a couple of tips that I can give you. Um, first of all, sometimes you know specific people and you know what type of thing they're going to run, so that's useful. But it's not a very helpful tip because that means that you really need to know a lot about people. If you have more than one sacrificial lamb, it's really, really important to get a POI. And from the POI, you guess the general direction their case is going to go and then adapt your sacrificial lamb according to their case. So if opposition says, we think the government should not intervene. Got it. They're going with the libertarian case. I'm going to have them accordingly to that, according to that. Or they might say, listen, these women didn't choose, shouldn't be allowed. Got it. They're going to go with banning. I'm going to spend my time sacrificing that lamb. Cool. And uh, the, uh, can, can you again very shortly clarify the, the, the criterion outcomes? So the utilitarian outcome basically says that there are practical outcomes 
as a result of this policy. Uh, what are they? Why are they good? And why are they better than the status quo? And the comparative opposition is going to give us. So those three are not part of, of the justification of why I think that. No, the justification talks about principles. So maybe I should have just said principles. So basically a principle explanation it doesn't really have to do with the utility, right? You know, there's like a, um, like maybe there's the Kant and then there's Mill and then they pretend to be smart people. Kant is, Mill is, you know, this, I think he has uh, some logical gaps there, but you know. I like Kant better, okay? Is this clear? Kant is better. It's, I hope all of you know that Kant was better. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. Can I add some questions? Yeah. yeah. Not exactly about what you uh, okay. talked about, but if I have like, if I'm prime minister and I have two points and uh -huh. the opposition uh, like rebutted one of the points and I think it's like lost point, I, I can't win it. I need to talk about it, just leave it. It's your decision. If you if you think it's a lost point, just leave it. Just let it die. Just don't spend time on it. Okay. <laughs> that um, most cases, though, your partner might have smart ideas of how you can rebuild it. So talk to your partner. Partners might be very helpful. Okay. Going back, because we need to talk about. Oh boy, we need to talk about mechanism now. Um. We'll talk about now about uh, analysis and perspective, and then we're going to go back to uh, why can't um, I'm telling you the Zoom thing is going to kill me. I'm terrible with technology. Okay, cool. So general points for uh, for in debate analysis. So first of all, make sure that you notice that the government isn't trying to change anything. Right? There's this house believes, and there's just a comparative of two worlds. Second of all, we really talked about this, but in debate, we really like to talk about a, a criterion, right? Criteria is, is plural, criterion is singular. I found this out, I think in 2016, and I thought that this was the most fun fact about the English language. I always thought criteria is like you can't count, but it's criterion, which is one, and criteria is multiple. Cool. So what a criterion is, basically, what it basically means is a definition of what you're trying to achieve, achieve in this debate, and what is the thing that if you if you if you manage to fulfill the criterion, then can you win? So, for example, this house believes that apples are better than bananas. What you really have to define is what better is, or in other words, what good is, right? Because if side banana say that the criterion for good is the color yellow and for some inexplicable reason they prove it they win the debate but if side apple say that the criterion for good is not being pushed into horror in your bag when you go to work then side apples is probably going to win now it's a very silly example but it really works in multiple debates so let's say, let's take last week's debate. Who remembers last week's motion? Well, I'm being able to access uh, criminal. So criminal records, right? And it was quite interesting to notice how different teams in that debate defined what the criterion was for their side, right? One side said that the most important criterion is rehabilitation. And if rehabilitation is the most important thing, then everything else, like worker, like the rights of the employer or ensuring safety in society, seems less important, right? But other side, but other teams said that the most important criterion is safety, and ensuring society has faith in the system and functions well. So if that is the most important criterion, then that side might win. So when you really have an analysis debate, it really is important to make sure that you define what is most important, what is better or prefers or regrets in this specific case. So this house prefers communism to capitalism. It really depends on what you think is important within those systems. So for example, if I say, I think the most important value in society is equality and they prove it, then maybe, you know, 
communism seems to be more important. However, if I manage to remove the criterion for this debate is freedom, then do you, you, you win from the capitalist side. But it's really important to have a criterion that allows you to have, you know, continuation and, and, a, and a metric, you know, you might say, you know, a metric for judging this debate. If I, as a judge, don't know what's important, it's going to be impossible for me to decide who won. And that means that I, as Valia, decide and not you as a team. So just placing and saying what's more important is probably the most crucial bit in this whole debate, also in policy debates, but it's comes, it becomes very, very clear in analysis debates. Questions about analysis debates? Yeah. <laughs> um, so as, as the, the, the other side, the other theme, uh, I'm allowed to, uh, to argue about what is the, I don't know, best criteria and also about the analysis of why their thing matches this criteria, so. Yep, yep, that's right. There's two burdens of proof. One, what is the criteria? Why do you fulfill this criteria in the best means possible? And then the debate can go either way. The other side may agree with you that this is the criteria and then you only talk about who fulfills the criteria better or maybe they may say, no, we agree that you fulfill this criteria, but how you get what, but this is not the criterion for this debate. Cool, other questions? Okay, lovely. Um, just a fun fact about Israeli politics. It used to be that the conversation within Israel uh, was that what criterion is more important, safety or peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If you notice over the past 20 years, the criterion is no longer disputed. Both sides say that peace is most important. The question is, how do we get there, right? So this is a real life example of how this conversation trickles down into political life and also in our civilian regular life. And I think it's quite cool when you notice the shift of the clash, right? And this is where clashes come in, whether the clash is the criterion or the clash is um, who fulfills the criterion better. Anyway, that's a fun fact. Um, I like to talk about it. You get to listen. Cool. So general points for perspective debates. And these glasses, the perspective, just pictures that are relevant to the topic. Okay, good job, Valia. So the criterion in this debate basically becomes the priorities of the actor's perspective. Whether the debate, whether we debate, whether we should um, uh, uh, assassinate Putin, whether Nat, Nate, this house, uh, this house is NATO would assassinate Putin. Putin. What are NATO's interests? Why assassinate Putin is going to uh, reach those, those, you know, reasons. I mean, the criterion is the priorities. If we go back to the Harry example, you really have to define Harry's priorities and talk about that. Um, I think there was a, there was a, a fun motion about whether uh, Israeli ultra-Orthodox should stand for the siren that commemorates fallen soldiers or Holocaust um, victims. And there's a real question of what are the interests of the ultra-Orthodox man or woman, person basically, um, when they stand or choose not to stand for the siren, right? Whether it's how they're perceived in society and then they should really stand, whether it's uh, principles um, and whether, whether their disagreement would be let's say uh, Zionist state is enough of a reason. I mean, all of these are very interesting points. I think one of the most interesting debates was in, uh, there was a tech open, I think it was in 2014. And the final was this house, uh, this house as a Pal Palestinian authority would enact a third intifada. And then there was a real conversation whether whether a third intifada, what, what were the interests of the Palestinian authority? What did they want? Uh, did they want more international attention? Did they want the right, what kind of international attention uh, they wanted? Because it's very easy to say, um, or fairly easy to say what an intifada is going to cause, right? We all know this, but the question is, what are the goals that, that the third intifada is going to, uh, to reach? And that was a very fun debate to watch, but you should really define the criterion of the priorities from of the actor that you're basically de de uh, defending in this debate. Cool, questions about perspective debates.
Yes, I get to keep talking. Lovely. So we're now going to talk a little bit about a mechanism. And this is what I'm going to spend most of, like at least five minutes uh, talking about. Because a mechanism is, a, is an area of expert, of my expertise. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's, it, is, it is something that usually uh, gets either too much attention or not enough. And it's very difficult to find this sort of um, balance. So four points about, um, and three sub points about a mechanism. So mechanism usually comes after you define the problem before you start going into your points. And it really should be very, very simple. I'm going to say this many times, but this is the first time. A mechanism is not going to win a debate. It just can't. There's no, no way that you can out mech all of the possible attacks on your motion. Every time you make a complicated mechanism, you're more likely to hurt yourself than you're likely to hurt other teams. So first of all, when you plan a mechanism, don't plan it during your prep time for more than five, three to four minutes. You have only 15 minutes. Don't waste that much time on the mechanism. What I didn't write here, but should be also part of a mechanism is a mirror of your arguments. So what I like to do is I like to think of arguments and then build a mechanism that protects those arguments as opposed to making a mechanism and then try to derive arguments from it. So first of all, don't plan it for more than three to four minutes. And it really is an exaggeration. I don't plan a mechanism for more than 30 seconds. Second of all, make sure that your mechanism is easy to understand. If the judge has no idea or is rather clueless about your mechanism, you're not going to win this debate. And you really want to make sure the judge understands what you are proposing. Thirdly, the mechanism should define words in the motion. So if there are words in the motion that are not clear or deserve a definition, you should probably explain them in your speech. So banning alcoholism, uh, banning alcohol, it seems, well, banning alcoholism is a good idea, not practical, but banning alcohol is rather simple, right? But let's say in 20, 2005, there was the heat that could. Israel left uh, the, uh, the, occupy, the, the occupy or free territories of the Gaza Strip, right? Israel left its, uh, or was no longer present in the Gaza Strip. And there is a motion, this house regrets um, Israel leaving the Gaza Strip. This, this house regrets um, and in most cases, you really have to define what the Itnatkut, what the leaving of Gaza means in the context of this debate. Do we, do we regret not having civilians live there? Do we also regret not having soldiers there? Do we regret a specific line? How far have we progressed? Do we, like there are different things that you really can talk. What is the heat net good? Like, is this a process? Is this just a one-time thing? Just making sure that the debate is crystal clear about what is regret, what do we regret, what is the heat net good are really important bits to talk about, especially if you plan on debating on an international stage and you get this lovely uh, motion, okay? Um, so for example, we go back to the, my example from the beginning of the class about the, Philharmon the Israeli Philharmonic. This is an excellent opportunity to explain that the Israeli Philharmonic thrives on governmental money. And if you don't explain how the orchestra works, it's going to be unclear why the government has a right to ban it or allow it playing Wagner, right? But the financial dependency explains why the government can make such a claim from the beginning. So trying to make sure that everything is crystal clear and, and all the words and mechanisms are defined is a very important bit of the mechanism. Fourthly, every, mo every mechanism is going to have some reservation. You can't just, you, most cases you're going to say, I would like to exclude this demographic out of this debate. For example, when we talk about motorcycles, most of you said, you know what, we'd rather exclude um, first aid responders. First aid responders may have motorcycles, for example, but you're excluding, you're, you have reservations. Or for example, banning alcohol motion, you might say, I'd like to allow religious practices that require alcohol, like um, the Mesa in the, um, in the Catholic Church, for example, that requires wine. Um, because you don't want to deal with the attacks from about, you know, the religious backlash, for example. 
So a couple of things about reservation. Reservations, three things mostly. First of all, every reservation is a wavering, is wavering of principles. Every time I make a reservation, I say I'm excluding a bit of this debate, you lose a principle. So for example, if I say, um, I'd like to ban uh, motorcycles altogether, always, but then you say, but I'm allowing motorcycles to be held, to be held by, by the police, then you say, you know what, you're, 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 you're wavering, you're minimizing the principle of why you're allowed to be on this and why banning this is such an important and crucial thing uh, in this debate. So every time you reserve or you exclude something out of your mechanism, your principle is going to be a whole lot smaller. Secondly, every reservation minimizes attack from one side of the motion, but opens up an opportunity to attack from the other side. So for example, if I were to say about the prostitution motion, and I would say, I'm going to legalize prostitution and everyone can do whatever they want with their bodies, but I'm not, but I'm going to criminalize the men who go to prostitutes because I think they're using them for their purposes and are harming them, right? So this reservation harms the principle of giving these women a freedom to choose where they're going to work, for example. Um, every time you minimize, your, and what government is trying to do is to ensure that you don't have bad and mean people try to make use or, or, or um, uh, oh, I forgot the word. Anyway, be mean to these women, right? And when you try to navigate the mechanism, make sure that when you make it small or you don't open up yourself to other types of attacks uh, from the other side. Thirdly, a mechanism can't solve all the problems in the universe and can sometimes cause significant problems. And you really should be aware of the other effects that your mechanism can have. So uh, for example, um, I chatted with some debater from last week. And there was an interesting motion in the room that I wasn't part of, that basically said that in the motion whether um, that, that you talked about uh, criminals and their not, not having revealed, not having revealing um, information about criminal records, one of the teams decided that their mechanism was that let's say the police would decide which relevant crimes should be reported to which relevant jobs. Now, government, thought they were very clever with this mechanism because this means that no irrelevant criminal activity was uh, given to the employer on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, uh, and, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, the uh, criminals, the, the criminals um, privacy was being upheld, right? This is basically what they were saying. The thing is that by doing so, there is a whole other realm of attacks that can be mandate in this case. So for example, if I were opposition, I would say that the police are a terrible people to disclose information about criminal activity because the police don't really know anything or enough about workers or workplaces and work positions. It means that the policemen are either going to disclose too much information or not enough because they want to cover their asses. So they either are going to be too scared of revealing relevant information. And then the employer is going to have a false sense of safety and security that they have all the information where in fact they don't. Or the other type, the other thing that the police can do is reveal too much information because they want to cover their asses and they want to make sure that no information is held uh, in, in the dark and protect the employer, which in, in return really opens up the rehabilitated criminal to more scrutiny from the employer, right? So this is an example of how um, just a mechanism that's meant to help minimize, you know, the, 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 the big problems that the mechanism opens up, for example, uh, having too much information out there Open up, opens up a whole new spectrum of analysis and criticism from the other side just through the mechanism. 
So if your mechanism is too complicated, probably isn't the, the right way to do it. And make sure that the mechanism doesn't open up other ways and reasons to attack it. Questions? I got one. Yeah. Um, so I actually got two. First of all, um, sh should there, like, is there some way of preventing a mechanism from being um, too cowardly or too extreme, say in the, in the uh, taking for example, last week's uh, motion, uh, if government just says, you know, um, we want to disregard all, uh, you know, extreme crimes, all the rapes and the murders and, and such, and only deal with petty theft and, and stuff like that. It's obviously, you know, not legit, but how is it handled? So the next thing that I'm going to talk about, and I'm just going to say it out loud, and I'm going to do a slide about it, but in debate, there is such a thing as a squirrel. We don't know why we call it this way, but we just do. A squirrel basically means that a proposition is against the spirit of the motion. This means that this mechanism isn't aligned with what the motion is meant to be about. Now, I will say that when I teach in other places, I have to really explain this. At Weizmann, I have the prerogative of knowing that you guys are smart enough to not have me going too in depth. But usually when you read a motion, you sort of understand what the motion is meant to be about. So for example, this house would allow students to fire teachers, fire teachers, right? So it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a silly motion in my opinion, but, but, but it's got some merit to it. And side government can say, listen, we just want to make sure that the students vote for the worst teachers. So you need a quorum and you need for 70% of students to vote against this teacher. And this is going to be held only in classes that are grade nine and above, right? And this is like a reasonable setting because you're just making sure that kids that are like six years old and they're like three kids in the class don't fire an adult from their job, right? This makes sense. However, if same government says, oh, we're so scared of children for rightful reasons, children are scary. And they go, the class has to vote 100% at 100% attendance. Everyone has to vote against this teacher five consecutive times over the course of six months. And only then can this go in for the Minister of Education that are going to go in and talk to all the students and there has to be two months to make sure that you really make sure that this teacher is not fire for no bad reason. Also, then you have to double check with other classes to make sure that it's not just a one class issue, but two classes issue. And then the teacher is, is being put on hold for two years and then is returned to teaching. And then only if the other class after two years on probation, does the second class vote under the same circumstances, can you fire the teacher, you go, okay, this is not what the motion is about, right? This is not what this is meant to be at all. Um, and then you go, I'm sorry, POI, this is a squirrel. This is what, not what this debate is about at all. Um, another, another example would be, uh, this house would have bought, this is, <laughs> don't look for it. It's a debate of me online and I didn't do a good job, but this house, um, for example, this house uh, would ban the right to party. And then opposite, opposite, uh, opposition comes up and says, we think communism is terrible. And you go, well, you know, we agree. Or, but, but we just think what the, this is what the debate is about. Um, and while it's not a squirrel from the opposition side, it's more of an off-clash type, uh, type case. But you go, you go say, this is not what this debate is meant to be about. The, con the conversation is about the right to property as opposed to um, ideology, right? So you just look at the motion, you try to see, um, I trust you to guess by yourself. Cool, and another thing, uh, say you're opening government and you uh, propose a mechanism and down the line, you know, uh, say after, after okay, say, say you're the prime minister, you propose a mechanism and then people, you know, poke holes in it because that's the job, like the opposition. Yeah. And then you come up with like a refinement for the mechanism. Is it legit to, yeah. Yeah, so if it's an expected refinement, then yes. 
Um, if it's something that you're just like, oh, I just forgot. Um, so it's, it's like, they didn't say how many kids can vote against the teacher. It's like, okay, fine. You need 70% of kids that need to vote against the teacher. But if they go, um, this is a terrible, uh, but, 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 but you can't say, but, but if they say, uh, this is a terrible idea because kids make dumb decisions and you say, oh, and every kid who is going to vote against a teacher should go through a cognitive testing ahead of time to make sure that they're cognitively developed enough. That's not okay. So if it's something that would have been expected, it's okay to correct. If it's something that would not have been expected, it's not okay to correct. Can it also be mentioned in a POI after opening government finishes? Um, you can try. I will remind you that you can't win a debate through a mechanism. So it's smarter to just find the simplest mechanism you can that doesn't need a lot of defending and then try to make really good, smart, uh, you know, significant arguments around it uh, that are going to be more harder to, um, you know, to rebut as opposed to nitpick a mechanism. There are some debates that are mechanistic. Most of them aren't. Well, Nevot, this is your opportunity to shine. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, ask, short. Uh, yeah, ask first. Yeah. A short one. Uh, just like how how many like what's the might uh, of uh, of the debate types usually like in competitions? Like how is it usually like the propos like yeah the policy? No, no I'd say I'd say about four to five. I'd say it's a trend. It really depends the, the the trend that is being set. When I started debating in 2014, um, perspective debates were all the rage and like a third of debates were in perspective at least. Um, they're a little less popular at the moment. Um, would, I would say that they are mostly policy and analysis um, and I'd concentrate most on those. Um, I will say that, uh, that a perspective debate is just an analysis debate with just um, like another, a, a clearly set criterion. That, that, that's what I would say. And I, I feel like there is more analysis, but I don't want to be caught saying things I'm not sure about. Other questions? No, Navot, off to you.